Once again, welcome. Um, I'm Ann Pernick. I'm with the Business Ethics Network, which is a program of forest ethics, and I'm very happy to welcome you to an introduction to mindfulness for activists with our presenter, Angel Kyoto Williams. So a little bit about um, the different organizations and programs um, behind the webinar today. The Business Ethics Network, or BEN, uh, provides trainings, networking opportunities, and other resources to corporate campaign activists, um, people working to reform corporations in many areas, including the environment, labor and workers' rights, human rights, and animal rights. And Ben is a part of Forest Ethics. Forest Ethics is a nonprofit that demands environmental responsibility from governments and from corporations, and we create solutions that protect communities, wildlife, wilderness, and our climate. And uh, we are privileged to have Angel Kyoto Williams as the co-chair of our board and to have her teaching us about many things, including how to bring mindfulness into our work. Um, mindfulness is a part of our working culture at Forest, Forest Ethics. We believe it strengthens our work um, and uh, also our resiliency as people. And it's pretty well integrated into what we do. Um, we do meditations and staff calls. We talk about mindfulness in our work a lot. And uh, though I've only been with Forest Ethics a pretty short time, I can already see the benefits from having a mindfulness practice in the work I do in terms of being able to step back and get perspective on the work that we're doing and, um, and see different and more powerful ways that we can make change. And that's what today's webinar is all about. Um, I want to also say a few words about Angel Kyoto Williams. Reverend Williams is an author, activist, entrepreneur, master trainer, spiritual leader, teacher, and priest in the Zen tradition. She is the founder of the Center for Transformative Change and spiritual director of the New Dharma community. An early shaper and leading voice in the field of transformative social change, Reverend Williams' work bridges personal transformation and social change. She's the author of Being Black, Zen and the Art of Living with Fearlessness and Grace, which is a critically acclaimed book. book it was called An Act of Love by Pulitzer Prize winner Alice Walker and a classic by Buddhist pioneer Jack Kornfield. She brings a lens of justice for marginalized and impacted communities to her work on the environment, and she has been working with Forest Ethics through our board for 10 years. And uh, we are so happy to have her presenting with us today. And with that, um, we'll make sure that we can hear and see Angel, and we'll get going. There we are. All right. Thank you so much, Angel. And um, I'll move the slides along. Let me know if I'm in the wrong place. OK. Uh, so uh, welcome, and thank you so much. As Anne said, my name is Angel Kyoto Williams. I'm very happy to be with you. Is uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Anne? It's okay. Okay. So um, let me just make a little bit of a change here. I, I switched something and can't see what I need need to be. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So again, my name is Angel Kyoto Williams. Um, it, our time together is a fairly brief, and I want to leave plenty of time in order to be able to respond to your questions because that's always really the juicy part. So I'll just say that briefly, as Anne said, I've been sitting on the board for Forest Ethics for 10 years. I just became the co-chair and um, my other life is spent as a spiritual teacher. I've practiced in the Zen tradition and uh, beyond the sort of pop culture relationship to Zen. Zen is really understood as the uh, tradition that you know strongly focuses on sitting meditation. Uh, the reason or that I come to bring meditation is not because I'm sort of fixated on meditation for my own needs. It's because as a person that was an activist before I was a spiritual practitioner and ha or had any formal spiritual practice, I came to realize that the practice of meditation or mindfulness, the practice of bringing oneself back to moment to moment awareness, non-judgmental non awareness was extraordinarily impactful to my life as an activist. Um, I spent time doing activism, on activism, different forms of activism on behalf of uh, young people that were incarcerated for uh, the rights of young women and uh, voting rights and so on and so forth in my early life and I've never stopped 
being in direct relationship to activism as a way to express what's important to me and what matters in the world. So I come to bringing meditation not from the perspective of I've got something to sell activists or they need to do something to fix them, but rather this is something that is going to affect the work that we do out in the world. And I believe that it's important that the people that are doing work out in the world get their get access to the best tools and resources to uh, generate their own personal and inner life resilience so that they can be effective for what matters to them in the world. So that's how I come to this. So I'm going to start with, uh, if you give me the first slide, and talking a little bit about what meditation and mindfulness is more specifically. Uh, these, some of these slides come from a dear colleague of mine made them up, so I may not say exactly the same things, and, and you, but you'll get the idea that um, meditation, or you know, as it's now more popular, I like to say that mindfulness is the is the the way that people feel comfortable to say, like a non-religious um, form of meditation. And so I'll use mindfulness and meditation. Um, interchangeably, but I'm referring to the same basic practice that is aimed at training your mind to be in the present. And so, as I said, that's to bring our mind out of the past, which we're often focused on the past, what happened at some other time, or we're far ahead into the future. The result is that we actually miss what's happening for us in the current moment and we feel a sense of being out of sync because there's a drag when one is focused on the past and we have the uh, events and the situations, maybe I shouldn't have said that, was that the best way to approach that, or this is what I'd like to do, uh, this is what I'm hoping for. In the meantime, the, the only place that action can actually happen is in the current moment. So if we're lost in the past or overly focused on the future, we're not actually able to be as effective as we'd like to be, as attentive as we'd like to be, as uh, attuned to what's happening in the moment so that we can bring all of the resources that we have to bear on, that, on the current situation. And when we have all of our resources available to us, we actually end up with more choice so that the uh, part of that us, the personality part of us that's functioning could actually serve us instead of us kind of falling um, into the trap of whatever the situation is that's happening, gaining momentum and kind of taking over. And then we find ourselves doing things that we didn't really intend to do. We find ourselves behaving ways that we didn't really intend to behave. I'm sure all of us know what it is like to have been in a situation with somebody that is maybe that you're working with, with a colleague in coalition, uh, in a meeting where you said something and it wasn't really what you actually would have chosen to say, but you're kind of caught up in the momentum and the emotion of the experience. And what meditation and mindfulness does is bring us back into the current moment of our experience and able to sense the entire situation so that, again, we can have more choice about what it is that we're up to. The other thing that it does is it helps us to be more aligned so that what we're thinking right, and what we're actually feeling and the mood that we're in are, are more in alignment. And so, for instance, you know, we get up in the morning and we're feeling kind of out of sorts and it's difficult for many of us to not allow that mood to kind of take over our day or take over our experience and the way that we're relating to people as a result of that. Uh, by doing mindfulness and bringing ourselves into the present moment, the kind of draggy energy of a mood, right, which and mood tends to be leftover past experience that's being activated into the current and it makes what we're seeing in front of us quite foggy. So we're able to say, I'm in this meeting now and what I need to do is to be able to be attentive, to be open, to be spacious, to be available to the situation rather than allowing the mood that I woke up this morning to kind of um, 
go on and on in the back of my mind and I'm halfway having a conversation with the experiences that I'm having in my mind and halfway having a conversation with the person that's in front of me, neither conversation being clear or satisfying. So it helps to actually cultivate our capacity for leadership by bringing us in alignment so that people experience us as we want to be experienced rather than experiencing us as the different parts of us that feel out of conflict and out of sync with the current the current moment that's happening. And it develops our, what I want to say, we call them our superpowers, which is our ability to feel into the situation that is happening. So we all have that, uh, an understanding of what it's like to say that a situation feels off. Well, that's somatic awareness. That is to say that without even someone saying something and saying like, hey, I feel really off or um, a person is walks into the room and you, you know that they're angry or there's a situation brewing amongst your staff and you, you realize that something is going on. Well, meditation by clearing out the kind of noise and clutter of our mind enables us to actually be more attuned to that somatic awareness, that fundamental human resource to be able to feel, which actually happens much, much quicker than our mind is able to process what's going on. It has, is what has uh, alerted us to, to dangerous situations and helped us to maintain ourselves and to move um, quickly when we need to be able to move quickly and also to recognize when to slow down and pay attention to the surrounding environment and have our senses heightened. But again, if everything is cluttered, we can't actually do that. So that's a little bit of a hint uh, as to what meditation is and, uh, and some of how it functions for us in our day-to-day -day lives as activists and organizers and advocates for social change. Uh, next slide, please. I like to say to people that uh, you can the way that you can think of meditation is it's about developing a relationship with the inner you. So there's you and there's an inner you. And how do you know you have an inner you? Well, if you've ever had the experience in your life where you, I want to say, leave roadkill behind, as in something occurred, right? You meant to behave a certain way. But all of a sudden, you're looking behind you, and you've got a mess of a situation. That can happen in your interpersonal relationships, your relationships at work, your romantic relationships, any number of places. We all have had the experience of, oh, looking over our shoulder and looking at the roadkill of a situation that has occurred that in which we don't really feel like we were fully participating, and yet we know that the aftermath of, this, of that was left behind. Well, that's because, the, as depicted in the slide, much of our lives is actually driven by our inner awareness and our inner you, right? The, uh, the self that is driving all of our emotions, that is receiving the information, and then taking control of how we actually behave. And that distinction between us as we feel ourselves in, in the moment and inner us, which is kind of having a little bit more control of what's happening, when those two are out of sync, we end up with roadkill. We end up with experiences and situations that we feel regretful about, that we wish we had done a different way. And meditation allows us to develop a relationship between the outer experience and immediate experience we have of ourselves and the inner experience that we have ourselves, which are, is our more private and internal thoughts, feelings, of, and emotions that are undergirding all of the behaviors that show up to the world and express itself to other people as who we are. So that's part of uh, that's the, the first half of what is happening in terms of our relationship of having an inner life. The other side of that is if we do not have a relationship between our inner selves, right? if we don't have a relationship 
with this underlying aspect of ourselves that's really driving the situation. And we want to make change in the world. If we're not driving our own lives, then who's driving change? Right? That is to say, if we're not able to be in deep relationship and effectively drive our own behaviors where we have as much access to choice and resourcefulness in terms of how we show up, what are going to be the outcomes and the impacts on the change that we're actually trying to have in the world? And if you want some examples of where that misalignment or lack of relationship occurs and affects the impact that we have in terms of the work we do, you can just think back to the different times in your experience directly or that you know of where coalitions broke up because of high-strung emotions, where people couldn't work out the situation, where um, meetings are taking place and somebody blows up and they can't reconcile, where ongoing uh, conflict between colleagues, between partners, between bosses and staff, uh, managers, directors, between foundation people and uh, the, the development people where we can't, just can't get along and we can't get ourselves aligned in order to move forward. And that's basically because uh, one or more of the parties involved are not able to get in sync with their internal emotions and get aligned and clear with their purpose so that their inner lives are not driving the outcome of the situation. We want to be clear about the purpose that we have for bringing about change in the world, and we want to be able to set aside the noise and clutter of moodiness, of mental chatter, of distraction. The distraction is a big one because all of us are uh, have far too much work to do. There's m many things to change, and that often actually presents a paradox for us because we think, well, I have so much to change, and there's so much for me to do. How could I possibly spend time sitting around uh, doing nothing, which is often what people think of as meditation? My question back to you would be, in that case, if you don't take that time, as many of us have not been, to take that time, taking that time to get in alignment with the part of ourselves that's driving our behavior, are you willing to continue to accept the outcomes of situations gone astray, of distraction taking over your capacity to focus on the work that you have to do in front of you, on being disorganized, uh, feeling unproductive and not being able to get yourself on track, or simply not being able to establish a calm and clear break from your work at the end of the day so that when it's time to go back into your home relationships, you're not bringing all of the stress and distraction and dysfunction of work into your home life and, and starting a cycle of upset there as well. So I'll leave that question to you and I'm going to bring us to uh, start with a, just a basic meditation practice so that if you want to get some sense of what it might be like if that isn't if you haven't had a chance to do it yet. I'll give you a little bit of an access to a meditation practice that will um, maybe debunk some of the myths that you might have about what meditation practice means. So we start with the body, right? And we say sit sit upright. And what that means is that you want to have your your back upright, but you don't want to be stiff and what, that, what helps to do that is to actually press your crown towards the sky and to make sure that your sits bones, right, the bony protrusions under your buttocks are ex extended out behind you. I like to lean all the way forward and make sure my sits bones are out behind me and then press myself up pressing the crown of my head towards the sky and it causes my chin to drop a little bit. If I'm sitting in a chair, I want my feet, my knees just about level with my hips. If I'm sitting on a cushion or a rolled up towel, uh, I want to make sure that my knees are and my buttocks are actually forming a triangle for stability. 
right? So you want to have three points touching the earth, whether that's the two feet and your buttocks, or your two knees and your buttocks, or maybe have cushions underneath if it's a classic meditation posture. I can't really show you that. Maybe we'll have another session where we do a more in-depth so you can really see my body. But if you have cushions propped up under your knees, for those of us who, who our knees don't go down and touch the floor easily, you can just prop them up. But you want to have a stable foundation forming a triangle, as you see in the slide. You want to have a stable foundation of a triangle because a triangle is the most stable posture. <clears throat> so then you want to uh, place your hands on your thighs and broaden your <clears throat> excuse me broaden your body from left to right so that you're opening your chest nice and wide. And I like to teach this uh, way of doing meditation for those of us who are in the world because it's really about centering ourselves and we can do these same actions when we're actually going in the world. So we don't have to think of meditation as some really tweaky off thing that's going to make us look weird. And in extending our body from left to right and, and we, we open ourselves into relationship and Kind of uh, bring our chest forward in a gesture of really facing the world so that we also get to understand that meditation and mindfulness is not about hiding from the world, but it's actually about facing the world. And by expressing the full width and opening into the full width of our body, we're extending into relationship with this, both the space around us, but also the people and all of our relationships in the world. So we're not hiding and disappearing, even though we're turning our attention inward, but rather we're expressing the intention to be in relationship with the world around us. And as I said, we're ex also extending into our full length. And by extending into our full length, we're expressing both the relationship through our width, but also our own personal dignity through the length of our body. And that means to not be collapsing, kind of having your shoulders drop, but, but to really feel your own sense of dignity and a celebration of your best intentions to face the world and to take on the challenges of the world because it's truly a dignified role and an honored role to hold in society. It helps to take your tongue and just put it uh, on the roof of your mouth, which reduces swallowing. And so a lot of us are familiar. If you've ever tried, you feel like you're swallowing and swallowing. So if you just, it's a little trick, take your tongue and just put it on the roof of your mouth just behind your teeth, and swallowing will be reduced. Yeah. And finally, casting your eyes downward. You don't have to close them completely. I like to say that when you close your eyes, since most of us when we close our eyes it usually means we're going to sleep. It's like having a movie screen and if you have a movie screen what's going to happen is you're more likely to make movies. If it feels more comfortable to you to close your eyes completely you can, but the active style of meditation that I teach for people that are doing change in the world is to simply cast the eyes downward so that you remain in contact with and aware of the outer world as you're bringing your attention and dropping down into your inner world. Next slide, please. So functionally, here's what happens in meditation. It's really as simple as choosing a point. Right? So almost anything can be the point or object of your meditation. I call it the point. And all you're doing in meditation is choosing to recognize that you have one single focus, one point that you're going to bring your focus and your attention on. And anything at all that is not that point is what I call other than point. And so the idea is simply 
to bring your attention to the point. And any time you find yourself on other than point, and I literally mean anything that's not the point is other than point, you simply bring yourself back to the point. So the point that is most often employed is our breath. And the reason that is is because it's the tool that you always have with you. And as I always say, when you don't have your breath, you probably don't care about meditation anyway anymore. So we use the breath most often. There are different things that you can use, but let's use the breath in this case. And the idea is that you're bringing your focus to the breath, right? And the, you can feel the breath perhaps at your nostrils in the rise and fall of your chest or seated low down in the belly, which is where you want your center of gravity to be. Oftentimes we count the breath in order to give us a way to contain and know where we are. So next slide. And the way we count the breath is as we count, uh, breathe out, we count one. So on an out breath, one, on an in breath, two. On an out breath, three, on an in breath, four. The idea is that we count up to 10, but if you find yourself distracted, if you find yourself with your attention on anything other than point, you start at one again. And if, for those of you that think, well, I'm going to keep counting one, I used to think my name was, might as well be one when I first started to meditate because I so often was other than point. Now the last thing I will say for this part of our introduction is to say a little bit about the a whole thought we often have about am I getting it right. The idea in meditation is not, of course, is not to be caught up in distraction and the noise of our chattering mind the distractions in the room and the space, the running into the past, checking out whether we're hungry, going over the conversation that we had earlier, uh, re revisiting old situations, wanting to know whether we did the best we could, or jumping into the future, right? So clearly meditation wouldn't be that kind of space. But here's a secret many people don't know. Neither is meditation staying perfectly still. It's not staying perfectly still, and it's not even staying on point. Meditation is the dance of coming from other than point back to point. So as long as every time you notice that your attention is on something other than the point that you intend, in this case the breath, when your mind is, focus has gone to preparing dinner, when your focus has gone to, uh, to uh, the pain that's in your knee, you simply bring your attention back to breath. If your attention goes to did I do that conversation right? Notice that that's happening. Bring your attention back to the point. If your attention goes to, I don't really want to be doing this, that's other than point. Notice that. That's okay. Bring your attention back to the point. So for the duration that you've chosen, um, which I recommend that if you're starting out, don't go for 
half hour, 20 minutes, not even 10 minutes. Go for five minutes, sit down. If you feel like you can't squeeze out five minutes, put up three. Let me say that doing, starting a practice with five minutes a day and being constant and consistent is much more effective than trying to have long periods of time. Uh, set it up so that it's a consistent time so that you can do it at the same time because our body gets accustomed to that rhythm. And if you can, ask somebody to do it with you. If they can't do it with you in person, it would be a partner or your kids or something, do, do it with you, then you can do something online. We have a little online practice group that we do all the time and I introduce meditation to organizations and we engage in everybody, everybody in a 27-day challenge so you kind of build up the practice when you first start. And as it happens, if you miss a day, as many of us, it, it does happen, especially if you're, as you're building a new habit, you just start all over again and don't get yourself tripped up about it because that's other than point. You simply bring yourself back to the point of meditation. You don't want to make this uh, an irritant. You don't want to make it painful. You want to get yourself in a position where it feels like something that maybe has a little edge to it, but you begin to look forward to it. It should enhance your life. It should fit you. Uh, there will be some discomfort, whether that's in the body or in the mind. Of course, as we get to sit down and settle our mind, our minds are not used to being settled. and so. They'll be a little agitated and they'll uh, create a lot of distraction to keep us from uh, being still. But if you simply remember that all meditation is, is to recognize what is the point, right? What is the purpose? What is the place that I'm fixing my attention to? And whenever I find myself other than point, I simply gently, non-judgmentally non bring my attention back to the point. And as long as I'm willing to do that over and over again for the period of time that I choose to do, I am succeeding at meditation. I'm going to open it up for questions. I hope that was useful. And uh, yeah, let's see what you have to say about that. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Angel. Um, while I go ahead and take a look at the questions and get myself a little organized on that, will you um, please talk to folks about um, the 27 Days of Change um, um, practice that's coming up? And um, and I've included a web address uh, for people to to contact you about that and um, and a little uh, suggestion of what they write in the comments section so that um, they'll get some more information. Yeah, sure thing. So, as I said, I'm an activist like most of you, and I personally found for a, a, a long time, even as a person that had developed a meditation practice and developed a strong spiritual practice, that it was a uh, hell of difficult to keep it actually functioning in my daily life. And so over time, I developed a program in which there are intent, because we're not living, we're not monastics, we're not living in a monastery, we're not going to be able to go and retreat all the time, drop at the hat. At the same time, we do want to be able to develop our capacity, develop our skill set. And so 27 Days of Change is a seasonal 360 degree six point change program. So it's a self-driven program that has what I think of as the three essential elements to bring about change in your life. When I say change, I mean any kind of change that you've been trying to bring, hoping to bring, and not quite getting it by. Uh, the three essential elements to have some guidance, right? to have a clear structure of support, I mean, I mean a clear structure meaning in the form of a program, right? so guidance, a clear structure, in the, Program and also to have uh, support around you in the form of a community of people that are actually engaging the same thing. Uh, any of you know that if you tried to do something and you're the only one doing, it's kind of a drag because you can't really talk to people, so having a community of support is utterly essential to actually bringing about change. The other people may not be doing the same kind of change, but because we're all moving in the direction of change, our own personal change together. There's a, a great deal of momentum and a feeling of support and a camaraderie that is built where uh, it has been really profoundly impactful for people where they've 
thought about the kind of changes in their life, whether they're dietary changes, exercise, just doing a writing practice daily, getting getting up to speed on that, starting a meditation practice, uh, developing more patience with your kids, with your parents, with your partner, uh, all kinds of things I've seen people use for 27 days of change. We have a limited window of time that we let people come in and register. It's a very popular program. We're going to have to cut the registrations off this time. So if you're interested at all, uh, please go to 27daysofchange.com. And uh, very soon I'll be sending out an email that gives more in-depth uh, we have more than in-depth webinar that tells all about the program. So I'd love to see if any of you want to bring any kind of change in your life. We also offer mentor coaching for those people that choose that path. So if you want to bring any kind of change in your life, if you want to talk to people and hear from people that have brought extraordinary change in their life, mm -hmm. sign up and we'll get you some information. Wonderful. Terrific. Um, and I also uh, wanted to uh, note that um, several of you indicated you'd like more information um, about Angel's work and about um, about Ben, and we'll be getting all of that to you, too. And, and for folks who requested more information about Angel's work, we'll, there will definitely be information about 27 days of change in there, too. And um, Just about 27 days of change. Yeah. Is it 27 Days of Change, is my, as an activist, is my response to needing to bring a way to effectively deepen my own life and be able to move things forward in my own life, recognizing that I didn't have another way of making that happen for myself. And so it's the culmination of 15 years of experience, both as an activist and as a practitioner, it's uh, most of the people that participate are just like you, and so I invite you to check it out. Wonderful. All right, we have great um, questions here, uh, and I'm going to try to call on people. So I'm going to try to unmute um, each person's line one at a time here, and apologies if I say your name wrong. Please uh, please correct me. Um, Jailani or Jilani? Can you hear me? Maybe not. Jailani, can you hear me? Okay. I will ask um, on your behalf. You had two interrelated questions. Can you recommend a few ways to help youth recognize their power and abilities as it relates to activism? Can you suggest a few ways to bring meditation to youth, specifically teens, in ways that they fully engage um, uh, or embrace a practice? Yeah, I, well, let me start with the one from going backwards first. So to bring you, the program to you, you know, I, we sort of get this idea of like we want somebody to do something and we want it to do us because we see all the benefits and so then we're trying to push it. The best thing to do is to ask the kind of questions about what's going on with the youth that isn't working for them and to introduce a practice in, in that form, mm -hmm. right? And so, if the young people are having difficulty controlling their emotions, if they're having difficulty uh, being clear, if they're feeling depressed, if they're feeling like they want to improve their grades, if they want to improve their game. I mean, meditation works for so many things. It's just like pretty awesome and pretty easy to introduce like, hey, why don't you try this? And I would say start off doing it with them. Uh, give them the kind of instructions that are really brief. I offer that four-line instruction. Sit up right, extend yourself wide, because that puts you in relationship. Extend yourself long, because that expresses you, your inherent dignity. And give one full out-breath to, to begin, because we want to give more than we want to take. <laughs> and that kind of a simple four-line instruction helps people a lot because they don't make it feel so complicated. The nuances like tongue on the, you don't have to worry about that. You just get people started, make it as short and sweet as possible. That's really what works for the youth. I want to say that I develop most of my ability to instruct meditation with incarcerated youth. So that's totally where I got my chops at because it's got to be straightforward. They're bullshit detectors. They don't want to hear any. Uh, kind of like foofy language and you know, esoteric stuff, that's the way to go. Uh, my experience is that actually young people take to it quicker. Don't try to get them to do it a long line, for a long period of time. 
but they take to it quicker than they start sneaking off and going and working on it by themselves. And in terms of getting them to engage, you know, when we engage with ourselves and we're able to get clear about what we're experiencing, we're actually, we actually get more clear about what it is out in the world that we care about, and that simply activates us towards wanting to engage and change in a meaningful way. So I think it's a two-shot deal. You get to I have a bird, so I don't want to say kill two birds. <laughs> Two challenges with once. Get people clear and in touch with themselves and our natural innate goodness and our natural to, to, to desire to be compassionate and to be of service actually arises. Great. We have a question from Ryan Green. And Ryan, I'm going to uh, try to unmute your line. Can you, can yeah. you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Ryan. Hi. How are you? Um, my question was, when your point is a question, do you focus intensely kind of on the question itself, or would you um, allow space for your mind to wander and maybe, um, like, investigate some possible solutions? Like, for example, if I'm um, feeling anxiety, anxiety about some um, part of my activism, like there's a question, I don't know how to approach it, would I um, think about that question, um, po like, explore a possible answers and then come back to the point, um, or, I don't know, I was just... Yeah, interestingly, you know, all of the creativity studies says, like, leave the question alone, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what I would focus on in that case is actually this, the experience, there's two, two ways to go at this. First, I would focus on the experience that you have of not anxiety, right, like those gaps in which you're not having anxiety and let that be the point. Right, and then you know anxiety will kind of arise, and you notice it there, and then you return to that clear place. Right, like so I notice anxiety is there, and I simply come back. Okay. As the um, as the experience of recognizing that you are not your anxiety, that anxiety is simply an experience that doesn't have to take over. Right the uh, noise that it's creating so that you, the answer to your question can't come through because you have the answer, it's actually there for you, but the anxiety is inhibiting your ability to access it. And so that's one, another thing that's awesome about these kinds of practices is it gets us clear about who we are and separates us, puts some perspective between the challenges that we're experiencing so that we're not caught up in them. So I would go at it that way. If the anxiety, if, you, if your feeling of anxiety becomes um, more intense or it, like it feels very intense for you, you can actually turn your attention to a curiosity about the feeling of anxiety until it dissipates, right? Because if you bring your attention directly to the anxiety and sort of like look at the anxiety and be curious about it, right? Just be curious, like what does that feel like and what happens when I'm having this feeling, right? And so you're sort of working with, you're not actually asking these questions verbally, but just feeling like what does that feel like? Again, separation starts to um, arise so that you, you're, you're no longer overwhelmed and then whatever answer and information is underneath the anxiety will begin to bubble to the surface. But I wouldn't put my attention on the question itself. Turns out that the brain doesn't work like that. It actually gets more tight and more now, and your most creative solutions can't come through that way. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we have a, um, a nice, nicely timed follow-up here from Jesse. Jesse, I'm going to try to unmute your line. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, okay, so my question was, um, when you're looking at the inner and outer self, how do you recognize that alignment or maybe lack of alignment um, between those two states or your being? And like more pragmatically, how does meditation help you achieve that alignment? You you recognize it um, in the way that we all recognize a feeling of out of sortness, 
right? It's like we feel out of sorts. We don't quote unquote feel like ourselves. It's almost like you you feel like you're spending a lot of time kind of watching yourself doing things, and you, you don't feel in um, control is kind of a funky word, but I think maybe that's the best way to say it, right? You don't feel like you have a handle on how your life is unfolding. That doesn't mean that you can control all of the aspects of your life and what happens is you don't feel like you have a handle on yourself in terms of responding. So if you feel churn, right, you're not feeling a sense of flowing through even the difficulties and challenges. So this is not about everything's going to be happy-go-lucky and you're going to uh, have everything perfect. But your experiences of even the challenge does not feel like drag and friction on you, where you feel out of sync. It's sort of like if you watch uh, Star Trek, right, like any kind of sci-fi, like you feel out of phase with your life. It's this little like, right? And that's inner you and outer you are not together. When you when they're together, even the challenges that you face in your life are are faced with it with an experience of flow. Again, not to say that the, that they're not challenging, but you you don't feel ripped uh, apart. You don't feel torn in in the experience of the challenge. It's just like okay, here's what the challenge is. I'm going to face that. If there's a part of you that's kicking and screaming and dragging, you know you're not in relationship to the inner you. Um, and the way that pragmatically that meditation helps that is because the noise, distraction, like ongoing chatter, we start to f think that stuff is us, right? And so it's like you've got someone comes in the room, they're annoying, you're like, yeah, I can't stand that person, and they're going to really get on my nerves, and oh my goodness, here they come. And we're, we suddenly get caught up in all of that distraction or a feeling of judgment or like, what are they going to think of me? Uh, maybe I'm not doing this job really well. And we're so caught up in that, we think we begin to mistake the noise, distraction, chatter for who we are fundamentally. As a result, we feel dis -ease, right? Like we don't feel at ease with ourselves. And we let those conversations in that past fixation and future fixation drive us. Because meditation brings us in the present moment, right, because it brings our attention right back to point and back to point and back to point, right, where we choose to come back to point, experience is um, felt as simply experience. We're not trying to layer on what's happening now and what's ha what happened before and what's going to happen all at the same time. And all of that extra information makes us feel muddled and confused. Um, you know, we call that state oftentimes like being in the zone, where it's just like, oh, I'm just on this and I'm focusing on this. And even if it's a difficult thing to work with or if it's a joyful and pleasurable thing to work with, it feels like flow. It feels like we're in sync. We're in time sync with our lives rather than being stretched out and stressed out by trying to be in too many time continuums at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, there's a question from Kristen. Kristen, can you hear us? Kristen, can you hear us? Okay, I'm going to ask this question on your behalf. Um, any recommendations as far as mindfulness practices to manage feelings of frustration with fellow white allies? She writes, I am a white Buddhist practitioner who see the work of undoing white oppression as distracting from the Buddhist principle of non-separation. I'm getting very tired of hearing that, yet I also notice I am not all that skillful in managing that because my frustration mounts. So, not, not, frust not <laughs> frustrated in managing, what's the, what's the that? Can it's, you, can you um, she's, I'm not all that skillful in managing, um, 
I'm I have to read into it for her a little bit. So Kristen, apologies if I get it wrong, but I think um, she wants to manage this conversation um, about undoing white um, oppression um, as distraction versus uh, because of the principle of non-separation. I think she wants to bring. Um, I think she wants to align her practice with her activism. And she is hearing from some of her fellow pr practitioners that that is not respecting the idea of non-separation. Kristen, I hope I, I am getting that right for you. I'm just going to deal with the question of frustration, right? <laughs> and, and so uh, in, any, in any case, right, the feeling of frustration, which is what I heard sort of right at the top of the question, the feeling of frustration is in any kind of um, out of control emotion, right? Where something, the experience that we're having of an emotion, and an emotion is just like over attention on experience. We're having experience all the time, hot, cold, comfortable, uncomfortable, all of that is always happening. But then we decide to like over attach our attention to one particular emotion or feeling sense that uh, out of the billions of them that we're having all the time. And so simply bringing our attention into the present moment because the frustration of something that happens someplace and at some other time, right? So we have an experience, there's an emotional response to it, and then the experience, the situation itself is over. The fact that we're feeling frustration about the thing after the, the, the situation itself the immediate situation is over is because we're on replay, right? We're regurgitating that experience over and over again, and it's overlapping our current experience. And so simply coming back to the present moment over and over again is the way to deal with any difficult emotion. And so I'll just leave that in terms of the overall question, uh, that, that that's the way in which you know, anger, frustration, anything, any emotion that feels like it's taking you out of yourself and it's taking control of you, is we simply bring ourselves back to the current emotion, I would, I mean, excuse me, current situation. Feeling our bodies is a very useful way in which to really tap into the current um, experience rather than to be winding off into what's going on in our minds, in our emotional minds. Right, so feeling sensation, noticing the feeling of our buttocks, of our hands, of the quality of the temperature in the room, actually going, getting down to feeling senses is a very powerful way in which to drop us into the current moment and get us um, out of a loop and regurgitation of an experience that has happened at some other point. Great, and I'm seeing from uh, Kristen that, that she's... Um finding value in, in your answer. <laughs> so we couldn't hear her, but uh, so it's good. I'm able to give you that feedback, um, Angel. Okay, um, uh, we have a few questions. We'll get through as many as we can. These are great questions, folks. I'm going to try to call on um, Alden or Alden, if I can. Ah, there you are. Can you hear us? Ah, okay. Well, I'm going to ask on your behalf. Um, uh, Let's see, I lost, here it is. I think this is a really important one for us to get to. Uh, what do you suggest to people who want to start but can never seem to actually sit down and meditate? <laughs> yeah, okay, as soon as you get up, sit down. That's right. <laughs> that, that's the best way to start. So I have this mantra. If it, it's a really um, esoteric mantra, and so you have to pay attention so that you can remember this. No sit. No brush teeth. Okay. So no sit, no brush teeth. That means when you get up in the morning, um, I recommend changing out of your bed clothes if you can. Uh, if you can't, don't worry about it. Don't sit in your bed if you can help it. If you can't, don't worry about it. it don't brush your teeth until you spend I don't even want to say five minutes sitting, until you spend time sitting. Here's what you do with the time, right? Move through three clear um, experiences of, I got to get out of here, 
right? And so just sit down. Don't worry about a clock. Don't worry about a timer. Don't worry about any of that. Sit down. Get yourself in a sitting posture, upright, broad, um, in your dignity, one full out breath, retention on the breath. Something goes, I can't possibly be sitting here. Acknowledge it. Attention back to the breath. Okay, I think I should go make breakfast. Acknowledge it. Attention back to the breath. Third time you can get up. It will lengthen on its own. Do that every day. No sit, no brush teeth. <laughs> and if you don't find the time, the people around you will beg you to go and sit. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Carla. Let's try to um, do this question and we'll see where we are in terms of time. Okay. Um, Carla, I'm going to bring you in if I can. Can you hear us? Yeah. Hi, Carla. Yes, I can. <laughs> Hi, thank you both so much. I really am enjoying the presentation and the discussion. Um, you were mentioning uh, flow, and I think of meditation as really benefiting, perhaps trying to replicate or make it easier for us to get to that place. Yeah. And my question is about other things that have that kind of quality. For me personally, it's yoga. And <clears throat> in my yoga classes, I'm asked in every class um, to focus on intention, which sounds like the point that you're describing here. And so I know people um, may get that during running or painting or doing something, they get into that state. So is there something that's particularly beneficial about sitting or about stillness that you think makes it important to try to do that in addition to days when I yoga, or can I count that and sub it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like check, check that one off. Right? Yeah, I think I can get something different about it. And so what is different about it is actually you are training the mind to do it at will. So in, when we do physical movements and it's induced, right, like so in yoga or in running or you know, for me swimming or riding my motorcycle, uh, it's the state of flow is induced. That means it's brought about by the, what we're doing. That's not training the mind, though, to do it at will, right? So the, the meditation is about actually creating a, a training ground, right, like a training field, and being able to bring ourselves to that state of focus and attention at will. The value of that is when you're having a conversation and you are about to go off somewhere. First of all, you, you will notice more readily that you're, that you're going off somewhere, because when you're doing it in meditation and you notice distractions or anything that's other than point come up, you get better at noticing like, oh, I'm off point, oh, I'm off point. And then you start to notice, oh, I'm about to head off point. And the distance between being way off point and needing to come way back and being on point is, is actually shortening over time. So meditation is really, truly training the mind to be able to come to attention and to present moment at will, which is different than a in state that comes as a result of putting the body in a re repetitious pattern. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, Angel, do you have time for a couple more questions or you do? Okay. We're going to squeeze a couple more in. Thank you. Well, my um, assistant is not here and it's prob would probably say something different, but let's go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, you can uh, wave your hands at me when it's just too much. But um, we have another question um, about um, activism and mindfulness and non-attachment. Um, uh, let's see. Um, this print is really small on this, which is going to make it more likely that I say your name wrong. Nalia, I'm going to try to bring you on. Uh, correct me if I'm saying your name wrong. Can you hear Nalia. us? Hello, can you hear huh? me? Yeah, go ahead, please. My name is Nalia. Nalia, thank you. Um, yes, so this is in response to um, another question that was asked before. And my question is, Working on behalf of social justice issues can elicit a lot of emotion. So how does one care and practice non-attachment at the same time? And is that even the goal, to practice non-attachment um, in this work? Yeah. You know, non-attachment is funky 
terminology that we have that has been translated and so it gets misunderstood quite often. It just You want to think of it as not getting bound up, right? Like not being in, it's like you go to pick up a net, right? And, and we have a kind of like massive net of like interrelated challenges, social issues, social Ill ills that are in the world and we want to get our arms around them, be able to work with them. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The different things are related, and so it's great to get get our arms around it and get a hold of it, and so we can like make we can move move that situation and kind of unfurl it, and so that the net is actually all smoothed out and not one big jump. But if you get caught up in it, if when you go to get your arms around the social challenges of the world, if you get all, all caught up in it, you're not very effective. Mm -hmm. Right. right, and so it's not so much non-attachment as much as it is not being caught up, not getting stuck, mm -hmm. so that your emotional responsive and re responses and reactivity to the situation get you bound up, so that you're not able to see clearly, and you can't really now you're not you don't have your arms around the situation, you're caught in the situation. Right. Interesting thing many people don't know on a sort of scientific level is that meditation induces the parasympathetic ner nervous system, which is to um, rest and relax. And on the other hand, we have the sympathetic nervous system, which is like fight or flight. The thing is, is that when you induce, it's not an either or. Having parasympathetic nervous system does not mean we no longer have attention and focus. It just means our attention and focus stays re relaxed so we're able to see the whole situation rather than narrowing down into a small part of it eliminates our sense of choice and creativity. That was helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, we have a couple more questions, but I think, um, I know, Angel, I know you've got, <laughs> got a lot on your plate today. Um, Can you say the questions? Give me one second. I'd yeah. love to, if people have the I just want to see what my, okay, I see who's, who I'm being called by. I'm going to have my uh, assistant just check in. Read off the questions. I'll see if I can. Can I, what, maybe I can, I can push them together a little bit. So I won't be able to call on folks, but that'll help us get to more of them. One was about suggestions for people who find that they get uh, sleepy when they try to meditate. And another is, um, can your point be external, like a physical object? Yes. Yeah, that's cool for me. So sleepy, so breath, right? In breath, stimulating, creates alertness. Out breath, calm. If you are sleeping, don't count in breath and out breath. Count in breath and bring your focus to in breath. So in breath and simply let go and let out breath come, right? So no attention to the out breath, in breath, to let go. So bring all the attention to the in breath. That's one thing. And yes, absolutely, you can have a an object of meditation or point outside of yourself. Here's what super value and transfers about that style that I developed of point other than point for activists is this. When you're in a meeting, you still have point other than point, right? Who's speaking? They're the point, right? Who is, um, what is the work that ha you have in front of you while everything is going on in the office? Well, that's the point. And when you find your attention someplace else, back to the point. So this is active and functional meditation that you can bring. It doesn't have to be just sitting down, stillness meditation, it transfers immediately into your active life so that it's really about developing your capacity to stay present and have your focus on and your point of attention be whatever it is that you want it to be. Great. Um, so, Angel, we have two options. There are two more questions. <laughs> um, I could email them to you and then they can be part of what we... Go ahead. We, Go ahead. Do it. Okay. Um, yeah. So one of them, 
um, is about, let me see if I can find it, um, is about, um, okay, Vivian, I'm going to ask this on your behalf. How can educators connect contemplation and social change in students in higher education? This is the same as the response to the teen question. The, the reason that people ultimately are going to want to engage meditation is because they're going to find the value to what's up for them. So you just really have to invite the questions of like what's going on for people. Often for people in higher education, distraction, the ability to focus on the work that they need to focus on is, a, is, is pretty right, a, a feeling of overwhelm. Being able to do one thing at a time instead of being uh, pulled in eight different directions at the same time is uh, a very sure way to, to uh, present the potential for people. And again, simple instructions, not overwhelming, make it relevant to their life, um, let people take it or leave it because it's really up to them. Um, I would invite people into something really short, uh, really quick, really brief. When people have the direct experience, this is not a Buddhist practice, not a Hindu practice, this is a human practice to simply sit down on the earth and allow your mind to rest and relax and be restored. We, we all can benefit from it. It doesn't answer everything, but it answers enough that it makes it of value to a great number of us. And um, uh, Angel, who are some of the um, practitioners that you, I was just thinking in relation to this question, that you would point to people who, um, people like yourself, other other people now, or people working over the last 100 years who the, um, the students might have seen connect their own mindfulness and their activism, and, and so, if if the question had an ac academic component, who could we point to academically that the students might also study? Who could we point to academically? You mean oh, um, like which practitioners might they learn about who've who've done that, who've combined their their own social change and their mindfulness work? You know, certainly we, we know, right, but Gandhi is certainly one of them. Um, it wasn't spoken about often, but but King absolutely did have a meditation practice. Um, Alice Walker is a phenomenal example of someone that brings a deep meditation practice. There are many closet meditation people that don't talk about their practice, but they are absolutely um, engaged in the practice, and you can kind of feel it, actually. You'll, you feel that like steadiness that comes through that doesn't dampen their passion and their fire, but they're steady and they're clear and their uh, capacity for resilience is increased and enhanced. So Alice Walker uh, you know, comes to mind. Um, um, Angela Davis is a, is a yoga, pra yoga practitioner. As I said, King, uh, who, who else? I'm a little worried about like out, outing people. <laughs> There's a bunch of folks that, um, whether they're activists or writers or uh, creative folks, have meditation practice. One of the, when I put a list together, um, my, my brain is not accessing names quickly, so I'm happy to put a quick list together for people to you know, okay. go deeply into that. Yeah. Great. Um, also, there's all the good, fine folks that run forest ethics. That, you know, <laughs> There's uh, one last question, and before I go to it, um, I just want to thank you so much, um, Angel, for, for this today and for the ongoing help um, at Forest Ethics with all of this. I want to thank everyone for being here today. I want to thank yeah. your, your team yeah. at Transformative Change for helping get the word out. I want to thank our team at Forest Ethics for helping get the word out, um, and everybody who shared this with friends and colleagues and family and, and brought together um, a, a wonderful um, wonderful big group of people today. Um, thank you. and for Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's so <laughs> awesome to see so many people take some time out of their day to talk about mindfulness. I mean, that's just amazing. It says so much about where our movements are going. It says that we're, we're wanting to work smarter, not harder. It says that we want to be more creative. We want to be more compassionate. We want to be more courageous. And we want to do the things that allow us to do this without martyring ourselves and giving ourselves up and, and you know, our, oh, and tell everybody, eliminate the word struggle from your language. This work and the work of changing the world is the work that we're meant to do. It's about 
bringing ourselves uh, to be, we want to be more effective, but we want to do this in a way that is generative, that supports who we are and what we love in the world, that allows us to be more available to our friends, to our community, to our family, and allows us to win, win, win. Right on. All right, one, and here's our last question. It's from Aaron, and I'll ask it on your behalf. Um, mindfulness seems to have become a fad as of late. How do we keep the white power structure from co-opting meditation as another tool of capitalist efficiency? Yeah, I, you know, that's such a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable question. I, I have this sense that if you, if we all relate to mindfulness as dropping into, right, our, our, is developing our capacity to become present in moment-to-moment moment awareness of self and other. This is key. Moment-to-moment moment awareness of our self and other. That the natural, innate relationship quality of human beings cannot be overpowered. If we keep mindfulness as something that's about more about focusing on me, 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 and me alone, rather than me and my relationship to the world, my relationship to anything outside from, from myself, my relationship to other, then the, the natural ethical foundation of mindfulness and heartfulness shows up. So when you hear mindfulness, think of heartfulness at the same time, and there is no amount of corporate takeover that it will ever be able to undermine the power of the human relationship and our love and compassion and willingness to be present to each other and to ourselves. Great. What a beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, Angel. Thank you, everybody. And um, we will get you um, more information via email um, shortly. And, yeah, just a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you. You all rock. Thanks so much. <laughs> you rock, Angel. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.